chapter 8. If you don't know where Ecclesiastes is, go to the middle of the Bible, hang a right. Go past Proverbs, and it's right there. We are in chapter 8 because we've been working through um, this for a while now. And uh, just to kind of remind us, we believe King Solomon is writing this through a character that he has created called the teacher or the preacher, depending on your, your preference um, on how to translate the word there, that someone who gathers together some people to speak to them with wisdom. And that's what Solomon is doing. And he uses a very unusual method to do that. He uses great frustration. He uses phrases that want to drive us crazy to drive us or lead us towards an answer that we can not only stomach but embrace. So he talks a lot about life. He talks a lot about wisdom. He talks about, a lot about the injustices in life and the things that we see in life that don't add up and that we scratch our heads over. And he says, yeah, I see them too. And I'm somebody who's lived a long time and had the resources to walk this world, to read everything there is to read, to talk to whoever there is to talk to, to explore and experiment in every way possible and I'm finding that all of it is just smoke. None of it matters apart from Christ, apart from God. They wouldn't have said necessarily Jesus in the Old Testament, but they would certainly have thought of the Messiah. The Lord would certainly have been a part of that thought process. And so um, the message that the teacher, Solomon through the teacher, continues to bring us over and over and over kind of feels like we're making laps around the track. Now, I like to run, but I don't love to run on a track. Sorry, you guys who are doing track. I don't track and field. That's got to be tough because you just keep, the scenery never changes, or it doesn't change much, and you're going around and around. And sometimes in Ecclesiastes, it feels like we're making another path. But as he walks us through, he is progressing us and leading us towards a, a finale that's going to put a bow on this, and it's going to provide some relief. And every week, really, there's been a little bit of relief as he reminds us there is an answer that's better than everything is meaningless. Everything is smoke. There is an answer, and he's going to say that again today. Now, today, we're going to talk about um, four ways that uh, four ways where we find healthy perspective. Okay, so uh, the teacher, further observations of life and wisdom are going to play out. He's going to, are going to lead us to a healthier perspective and wise living. Those are the two things it's going to lead us to. And the, the teacher is going to use four, um, ad, I guess you could call them words of counsel he's going to give us. And these four phrases, are, are, or I guess four phrases, are going to give us um, some traction in the, in the areas of wise living and healthy perspective. So um, my, one, of, one of the things I've been doing since we switched to the afternoon schedule at 4 o'clock is in the Sunday mornings, I've been using it to kind of wrap up or maybe put some final, fresh thoughts to whatever it is I feel like God wants me to say on Sunday night, Sunday afternoon. And uh, so I, my, my habit is to, to go start the day over at Panera Bread and just go back through it and jot down some final notes and thoughts without any other books in front of me, just, just my journal, just uh, the Bible, and just, you know, just some, some time and space. And I sit in the same little round table in the same corner if it's available every time I go. And right next to this little round table, if you've ever been to the Panera Bread in Somerville, you know there's one big table in the restaurant. It seats about, I don't know, 10 people. And every week, about 8.30, maybe a little before, people start rolling in. And the table fills, and from about 8.30 to 9.30, the table is full. Sometimes they have to add another one of folks that have been to church or going to church or going to Mass. I don't know, they're from all over. I know there's some Catholics in the bunch, you can just tell. And uh, they seem to have a great time. They don't, I don't think many of them are related, but they act like family. They, they, they're always teasing one another. They have no problem picking at each other. They, they, um, they don't speak with a real big filter, and they just say what's on their mind, and there's a lot of laughter. And it's just a really beautiful picture. And so I enjoy just kind of being in the room with them sometimes, they get a little carried away, and I have to pop in my earbuds. And sometimes they, they speak about things that are pretty interesting, and I try not to eavesdrop, but one day I happened to catch pretty quickly somebody asked the question, 
They said, so we were there last night. Do we, does, does that count for church for today? And, and somebody else, apparently very knowledgeable, or the person to ask said, oh, yeah, of course that counts as church. Three hours at church on a Saturday night? Of course you can count that for your Sunday service. And I'm thinking, oh, did I just hear that right? Is that? And then as soon as that thought came and went, I realized, wow, that's exactly how I used to think. That's exactly how I used to think. How can I find a loophole in getting the check mark in the box for Sunday morning church but not having to go? This was before my preaching days, of course, um, although there are some Sundays when my wife tells me I still have to go to church. But, but you know, it, there's those times when you just want to, you know, I just want to rest today, like really rest, like not have to get dressed up, like not have to go somewhere. And this was back in the days when I actually dressed up for church. But, um, you know, so it was just not quite as comfortable as, you know, and it's the kind of the machine of what church can become sometimes. And so I kind of got what he was saying. And yet I knew that that in my heart, that's not where I wanted to be and that's not where I am today. And, and I think the difference for me, at least in my journey, was I went from seeing church as a religious duty to seeing it as an opportunity to gather with other people who love Jesus and to go and worship him with them. And to enjoy that time because I understand better than I did before that it's not about religion, it's about that relationship. And, and that's what he's trying to help us see here. He's trying to give us a healthy perspective. And he's talking about life, and he's talking about wisdom in life, walking wisely. So in this chapter, we're going to walk through these four points. And the four points, if you're taking notes, are going to be this. And I'm going to say them quickly, and then I'll repeat them as we go through them. The first one is that he's going to tell us he wants us to embrace wisdom. The second thing he's going to tell us is he wants us to obey and serve authority. So embrace wisdom, obey and serve authority. The third thing is he's going to say he wants us to recognize God's justice. Recognize God's justice. And the fourth thing is he's going to tell us be content and enjoy life. Okay? So let's, with that, let's jump in. So the first one is embrace, uh, embrace God's wisdom or embrace wisdom. And it comes from verse 1 at the beginning of the chapter and 16 and 17 at the end of the chapter. So we kind of got a bookends, I guess you could say, um, for this chapter. And, and so let's look at that real, real, real quick here. So the first verse says this. And it asks, starts with a couple of questions. Who is like the wise? Now remember who's asking this question. This is the one who, asked, who could ask God for anything, and he asked for wisdom so that he could better rule. And he's asking this question, has been over and over, who is like the wise? Who knows the explanation of things? Now, before I read the rest, the answer to that question is in verse 16 and 17. So let's move to those verses, and let me read those to you. Starting in 16. When I applied my mind to know wisdom and to observe the labor that is done on earth, people getting no sleep day or night, when I saw all that God had done, here come the answers, no one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all their efforts to search it out, no one can discover its meaning. Even if the wise claim they know, they cannot really comprehend it. Which should remind us of last week, if you were here, wisdom has limits. The wisdom that you and I can contain in our little brains is going to be limited at the end of the day. Even Solomon says his wisdom was limited, okay? Now, that shouldn't frustrate us. It should comfort us because God gives us what we need, but sometimes it's frustrating because we think we have all we need. And we talked about the two extremes. We have the, on the one hand, we have the escapism person who's putting their head in the sand and acting like a fool and could care less about wisdom. And then we have the theological snob who thinks they've got it all figured out theologically. And if you disagree with them, you're either too liberal or too conservative or you're just wrong. You're just less right than I am. Thank you very much. And you need to go and, and read somebody else. So we want to avoid those extremes. True wisdom comes when we recognize that we are not going to have it all figured out. And that's okay. That was one of the things I came out of seminary with that I actually remember. And that is, wow, the more I learn, the, less, the more I realize I don't know. And I had to either become okay with that or just pull my hair out. And I still have my hair, so you can see that I, I'm very okay not knowing it all. Now, let's finish verse 1, which says, A person's wisdom brightens their face and changes its hard appearance. 
which kind of makes you scratch your head sometimes with some of the people we work with and live with or hang out with because they don't ever smile. And you're like, so there's no wisdom there, maybe. Now, when I think of wisdom like this, I think of a wisdom that understands something about who God is and what he's done for us. Because when we understand that, there becomes this inner joy that comes out. And my smile is not a plastic, forced expression, but it's a, just an overflow of what's inside of me. And, and that, that's not from a happiness based on circumstances. That's a joy that doesn't matter what circumstances under which I can. It's how Paul could write the letter Philippians with the theme joy while he's in prison for something he didn't do. There wasn't anything wrong with what he did. It's just amazing how joy transcends our circumstances. So uh, I just so that's the the wisdom piece, and uh, I had a I, I wanted so I wanted to give you just two two uh, so there's two things here really I want you to see there's of course there's the um, there's the value of wisdom right we read in Proverbs little nuggets of wisdom and we're going to see some more in this this right here so there's value in wisdom just and making good decisions with the information that I have okay then there's also even though there's limits to that wisdom there's the source of wisdom and that is God. Okay. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't feel like a very wise person. I struggle believing that I'm wise at all. But I am encouraged by James 1, 5, and 6. Because um, what, we, what, Su what Susan read earlier just reminds us that if anyone lacks wisdom, okay, if, you don't, if you feel like you need some, here's your counsel, here's your prescription. Okay? I'll write it down in something you can't read, so you won't, you know, I'll be like a doctor for you here. If, anyone, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who believes is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So how you ask matters, James says. You should ask, but ask with a humble faith. And God will, he's going to, he promises to deliver. That's pretty awesome when you know, that's a prayer that I know God will always answer. Ask for wisdom with that attitude. So those are the, so when I think of wisdom, I think of two kind of categories. I think of the category of wisdom that gets to me, and I think of the category of wisdom that I'll never attain because I'm never going to be God. And, but I'm going to, so I'm going to cling to him as the wisdom I need. And that is Wisdom. To do to recognize your limitations and embrace them. Embrace wisdom is the first point. Number two is uh, that we need to obey and serve our leaders. Um, starting, this is going to be verses two through eight. So let me read through this. It's going to be a little all over the place. I'll have to warn you. And then I'm going to focus in on really verse two in particular. So it says, "Obey the king's commands." And 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 I will acknowledge right up front that if you're reading out of some other translations, it's going to say read a little different, and that's because there's another take on this, and I'll explain it. So hang in there. Obey the king's command, I say, because you took an oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to leave the king's presence. Do not stand up for a bad cause, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since the king's word is supreme, who can say to him, what are you doing? Whoever obeys this command, his command will come to no harm, and the wise heart will know the proper time and procedure. For there is a proper time and procedure for every matter, though a person may be weighed down by misery. And you can see he's kind of, he's kind of spreading on the bread all these little wise statements, okay? We're not going to focus on those. We're going to focus on the bigger idea in this. But hang in there. Verse 7. Since no one knows the future, fact, who can tell someone else what is to come? Rhetorical question, answer, nobody. Verse 8, as no one has power. Okay, so in verse 8, he's going to give us three parallel statements, and they're going to all point to the fourth, fourth and last part of the verse. So I'll count them off as I read them, and then it'll all support this last part. As no one has power over the wind to contain it. Okay, we can sail, but we can't control the wind, right? So no one has power over the time of their death. You really don't. You can't guarantee that you can choose when you're going to die even if you try to take it yourself. And as no one is discharged in time of war, a wall not allowed, so wickedness will not release those who practice it. And this is kind of for those, and this would kind of the way that folks live in our world, people who want to be favored by God, but want to practice wickedness. 
And this is saying you can't have it both ways. Wickedness will have a hold on you. And if you practice wickedness, you're not going to get let go. It's going to hang on. Because you're showing through your actions your lack of faith. And faith is what saves. God says he saves us by grace through faith. Okay. So now let's go back to verse 2. So the, the, uh, the point here is obey and serve your authority. Um, Romans 13, um, which um, Betsy read for us, Romans 13, 1 and 2 says, um, I just want to reread it real quickly here. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. So it doesn't matter whether you like the, uh, the person who's in the White House, God put them there. Okay? And we're supposed to gladly submit to those authorities. Doesn't mean we have to like them. Doesn't mean we have to agree with them, but we are to submit. And if you get to the place where, and this is kind of a side note, but if you get to the place where I cannot in good conscience submit to that authority, then civil disobedience may be appropriate, and as long as you're willing to pay the consequences for doing that, then so be it. And there are, there's a time and a place to do that. Just ask Martin Luther King Jr. when you see him on the other side, and you can, you'll get some of that. Okay? But there's no guarantee that you're going to live or not pay the price as he did. Others have done it and have been rescued by God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. They, they were practiced civil disobedience. They defied the order of the king, and God delivered them right in front of the king. Daniel defied the order of the king, was thrown into the lion's den. The lion said, no, I'm waiting for the, I'm waiting for the main course. We'll skip uh, uh, Daniel here. And God delivers him from the lion's den and sends him a better meal. That's, it, you don't know how it's going to play out. We just know that um, he wants us by our rule of thumb is he wants us to obey the governing authorities, that God has put them there for a purpose, and that God works in and through them, okay? And a lot of times he does that through the people who serve them in the, in, in the I'll call it in the shadows, not necessarily in a negative sense, but they're the people that you don't see, unless there's a scandal, and then they're the ones that get thrown under the bus. So let's, let's talk about the other way this is read, and I'm going to pull this up in ESV as a, as a contrast. And uh, I want you to, okay, so here it is. So the English Standard Version says it this way. I'm, I'm in verse 2. I say, keep the king's command, which would, you could say is similar to obey the king's command, but different, okay, slightly, because, here's the thing that's greatly different, because of, the, uh, because of God's oath to him, that is to the king. Now, NIV says, because you took an oath before God. So different people are taking oaths in this, okay? Now, whenever I find this to be the case, which isn't very often, um, when I find two very good translations disagreeing, it's usually over a nuance. And usually when I conclude what's the difference, it ends up not mattering a whole lot, okay? Because the application ends up being the same. But that's how I test it. So what are the implications of this if I believe this is the right translation? What are the implications if this is the right translation? Oh, and by the way, they could both be wrong, but... We'll give them the benefit of the doubt of doing good stewardship. God's overseeing the translation of his word, just as he oversaw the writing of his word. Otherwise, we couldn't trust it, and we can. So uh, the difference here to me is the difference between obeying governing authorities and serving governing authorities. Okay, so if I'm, I'm just called to obey governing authorities, Romans 13.1, that's very consistent with that. But the rest of the context to me seems to indicate the other it's really more geared towards the person that's standing next to the king or the president or the prime minister or the governor or the mayor or whoever's in charge. This is the person who is really trying to help the person in charge do the right thing, say the right thing, make the right decision. Okay? And you can look through scripture and you can see examples of where God has put people, Daniel is another great example of this, where God has put people unlikely people in places of great influence with rulers. Think of Joseph with, king, with the, the pharaoh of Egypt. He was in prison, and he became prime minister, most powerful man in the world, second to pharaoh, and it was simply because God moved him from A to B, because God can do that. And of course, we know from other scriptures that God can change the direction of a king's heart, um, and he can guide that decision-making as well. The point here is this. He says that there are people, and I hope God's people, who have influence over the people who are in charge. And as we think about obeying or serving those in authority, we need to ask ourselves the question, am I in a place where I can influence leaders? 
It may be because you, your office is next to theirs. It may be because you can write a memo. It may be because you can do something that will get their attention. I'm not saying that you need to consciously do this, but I am saying that you may have opportunities to do that very thing, and God wants to do it through you. So be ready. Do what God leads you to do, knowing that, and do not be surprised when you get the opportunity to do that. You could be like um, an intern on the staff in some big judicial branch or some big governmental branch or some military branch or something, and because you're in the right place at the right time, which God can do that, boom, influence. Okay? That's, a, that's not just a, oh, that would be cool. That's a responsibility. Okay? So don't miss that. All right? So that's another thing we're called to do. Another one we're called to do, this would be number three of four, and that is that we need to recognize God's justice. So, oh, well, if you read three, four, and five, you see that all of these are really related to that person that's assisting the one in charge. Do not be the one in a hurry to leave the king's presence. That's someone who says, I, that would be like somebody who got onto Trump's staff and they're, they've seen enough and they're like, I'm out of here. He would say, don't be in a hurry to leave. You have an opportunity to shake and steer that ship. Do not stand up for a bad cause for he will do whatever he pleases. Well, maybe you do need to leave. Or maybe that's talking about don't go attaching yourself to something else that would get you disqualified from where you are. Be wise, be careful. And, and, and just keep on supporting. And to me, that's why that's the one that seems to stand out a little better. But I want to keep moving. So verses 9 through 14 speak to this third point, recognizing God's justice. Now, I don't know about you, but it's pretty easy to just look around and go, you know, sometimes it looks like the righteous folks in, in the world just get a really bum rap. And it feels like the wicked just get good stuff. It just seems to work out for them. And he's going to speak to that. So verse 9 says this. All this I saw as I applied my mind to everything done under the sun. There is a time when a man lords it over others to his own hurt. Then, too, I saw the wicked buried, those who used to come and go from the holy, uh, from the holy place and receive praise in the city where they did this. This, too, is meaningless. This holy place could be any religious building of any kind. Okay? This could be someone who... Is I'm, they they um, they're a very faithful they're very faithful in the mosque, and they're very faithful a good Muslim and and then they they go do things that that don't make sense to even their own Quran, maybe, okay. So you would see hypocrisy, uh, maybe not depending on what they're doing. We see this in the church people who who are regularly in a church, but their life outside of church doesn't line up with that. When I was a youth pastor, I saw this a lot. I'd see kind of two groups of kids in my youth group. I'd see a group of kids that I felt like their heart was in it, and I would see other kids who were there and participated, but their heart wasn't in it. And kind of the, the, the thing that would always tip me off is that kids in this group and kids in this group didn't tend to overlap very much in, in what they were doing together. Even though from my view, which would have been a very limited view, I would see them both, if I asked one to do something or asked the other one to do something, they would do it. But this kid saw this kid Monday through Saturday or Monday through Friday at school or they saw them outside of the church walls. And, they would, and, and so when I would ask them, why, why, why can't you work with this person? He's like, because I know what they're like the rest of the week. I know how they talk. I know, how, I know what they think. And, and so I can't in good conscience, you know, join in with them. And, and so um, he's saying here that there's a hypocrisy here that looks like people get away with. Okay, so let's say you're at a funeral, and you know this person does not, this person is probably not going to heaven. Man, I know what they were like, and there's no way, and the preacher's up there talking like, this is a saint. Am I in the right funeral? You know, you've ever been in a place where you felt like that? Well, that's what this is talking about. It's talking about, so there's a, there, when this too I saw, the wicked buried, those who used to come and go from the holy place and receive praise in the city where they did this. This too is meaningless. Now, there's another phrase that's left out of mine. It's a, sub, it's a note. It might be in yours that adds to the praise piece and be forgotten and are forgotten, which I think is kind of his way of saying they're going to be forgotten because what they did didn't matter. So I, I'm, I think that this translation left it out because it feels like it contradicts what it's trying to say. 
This is a hard, this was clearly a hard passage to translate, which is why it's hard to understand those figures. So let's keep going. So in verse 11, he, he starts to turn towards this judgment thing. When the sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, people's hearts are filled with schemes to do wrong. And here it feels like he's talking about swift justice, right? Swift justice is more effective deterrent than if we arrest them here and they don't get sentenced for three years. There's a disconnect that eventually is going to happen versus if you slide this up real quick, it's going to be a deterrent. Now you have to be careful because you want to make sure you're just. And so there's a, there's a tension there to manage. Uh, same is true when you're disciplining your children. Okay, so if you immediately discipline your kids, well, they'll see the deterrent, but what if you're not right, righteous in how you're doing it? What if you're doing it out of a bad temper? What if you're doing it because you don't have all the facts yet? So, again, there's a tension to manage there, but the tendency is to let it get out there too far. And Solomon is pointing that out as another nugget of, of wisdom here in the context of recognize God's justice. Okay, because God cares about justice because he's holy. Now, skip verses 12 and 13. We're coming back. Go to 14. It says this. There is something else meaningless that occurs on earth. Imagine that, something else meaningless. Uh, the righteous who get what the wicked deserve and the wicked who get what the righteous deserve. This, too, I say, is meaningless. Now, we can relate to this, right? It's the, it's the wicked who drive cars we wish we had. It's the, uh, right, it's, it's the three-year-old innocent little kid that gets leukemia. It's the person who never smoked a cigarette in their life getting lung cancer. It's these injustices that we see that the righteous endure and the seemingly injustice that the, the wicked do not uh, seem to avoid or seem to have either. And, and it's very frustrating to see. because And if you look at it without a future, without the hereafter, it feels like smoke, it feels meaningless, it feels very frustrating. But God is saying, but, but the teacher is saying, but it's not just here and now. It's also in the hereafter. And this is where 12 and 13 come in and bring comfort. Although a wicked person who commits a hundred crimes may live a long time, I know that it will go better with those who fear God, who are reverent before him. Yet because the wicked do not fear God, it will not go well with them, and their days will not lengthen like a shadow. And I, I guess my summary would be, there's justice in the end. There must be justice in the end. Sodom Hussein will deal with not only the justice that this world deals with, but he will answer for the justice before a holy God. Adolf Hitler, same thing. Osama bin Laden, same thing. We could go down a list uh, of people who've done things that, no one would argue deserves punishment. But God will punish, and he always punishes appropriately. And so while it may be frustrating from where we're sitting when it looks like somebody's not getting the justice they deserve or others are getting something they don't deserve, God's going to settle it out in the end, and we can trust him to do that and do that well because he's holy, and that's what holy does. So, so um. The last, the last uh, point here I would say is this, and he says this in verse 15. So I commend the enjoyment of life because there is nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany them in their toil all the days of the life God has given them under the sun. So this sounds pretty good. Be content and enjoy all that God has given you. Philippians uh, was another verse that we share, verse four, chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. Paul is writing to the Christians in Philippi when he says this, or writes this, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul ought to know what it's like to have nothing. He knows what it's like to be shipwrecked and floating in the water for a long time. He knows what it's like to go without food for days on end. He knows what it's like to live in prisons where there's no such thing as prison reform. He has verse after verse after verse describing what he's been through. He wrote the letter of joy from prison. He understands contentment, and he highly recommends it. Okay, This was a thousand years before Paul even existed. And the teacher is saying, 
he is saying here, so I'll say it again. So I commend the enjoyment of life because there is nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany them in their their toil and their work all the days of the life God has given them under the sun. In other places, God, he, he says, enjoy God, enjoy his gifts, and enjoy your work. So when I thought of work, I thought, okay, there's three things about work we can take away from what we've seen so far in Ecclesiastes. Just three statements. Work. Young people, did you catch that? Yeah. Work. Enjoy your work. And enjoy the fruit of your work. Okay? All three of those are important. Okay? Paul says if you don't work, you don't eat. Okay? I hope that one got through. Number two, enjoy your work. Now, that, that's not always something you can control, okay? At the same time, how you respond to the circumstances in which you're working, oh, that is your choice, how you respond. You can't control your circumstances, but you can control how you respond to them. And three, enjoy the fruits of your work. You get, if you get paid for your work, that's not a hobby. That's work. That's good. That's a job. That's what we, we need. That's how you support your family and, and yourself, okay? So I would go for that, but... But also enjoy the fruits of that. Recognize that it is by God's grace that you're able to, to receive that and have that. No extra charge for that sidebar. Okay, so that we're wrapping this up, right? We're, fin- we're landing the plane. Here we go. So um, the, the teacher's further observations of life and wisdom really lead us to these two things. A healthier perspective and wise living. That's where it leads. So I challenge you to consider your perspective on life. Think about where you're coming from. Are you more like the person at Panera Bread who is like, well, I, you can check that box Sunday morning if you went Saturday night because, oh, man, it's just your duty, duty, duty. Yep, you'd be a religious person. Be a good religious person. Duty, check, got that. Don't need to, I, I'm, I'm, I'm good for six days. Or is it, no, I get to know God. I get to know my creator. I get to know the one who rescued me from sin and death, shame and guilt. So I get that. And then it's drawing the wisdom from Scripture that he gives us here and living and applying these things to our lives. Okay? If you want, if you want to get a taste of that, just read Proverbs 8. I mean, we were in Ecclesiastes 8, and I was reading through Proverbs 8, and it's like, wow, it's just, it's just loaded with good stuff. And in fact, in Proverbs 8, it even personifies um, Proverbs. It, in other words, it put, makes Proverbs like a person, and it just points back to God. So at the end of the day, what matters is what we do with this, okay? Am I going to act on this? Well, the way you know if you believe something is if you live as if it were true. The way you know if you believe something is if you live because you know it's true. You change your actions, you change your attitude, and you change your words to line up with what you really believe is true. See, we either believe truth or we believe a lie. There's really nothing in between. The question is, how do we know what the truth is? And then once we hear the truth, do we have the courage to believe the truth and change our life where we are believing a lie? Okay, quick example. If you hate yourself, then you're believing a lie that you're not worthy. You're believing a lie that you don't matter. You're believing the lie that God doesn't love you as you are. That's an example of that. But that God is, that's not God of the Bible. The God of the Bible treasures people. He created us, motivated by love, for a purpose, on purpose. And so to believe that truth, then you have to decide. Then when you look in the mirror and you go, I hate what I'm seeing, you have to reconcile that thought with, but God loves me and treasures me, but I hate myself. But God loves me. How do you reconcile that? That's where the crisis of faith comes. And that's where you have a choice to make. I'm either going to believe God and his word or I'm going to believe the lie. And your life after that, it's all dependent on how you respond to the truth that can set you free. Submit to the truth. Believe it. And you will find peace and all the fruit of the spirit that God promises to those who know and love him. And it will change your life. And I have a feeling if it changes your life, it's going to ripple through your life too. Let's pray. Lord God, um, folks are all over the place spiritually that are in this room right now, and I just want to uh, give them a little space to just process and think about how do I respond to this. I just want to give them those two questions I like to ask. The first question I hope that they will wrestle with is, God, what are you saying to me right now? What are you saying you want from me? What are you saying I need to understand or believe 
And maybe it's already clear. If you have that answer, which is not always easy and quick, then the second question is, what am I going to do about that? Because that's where change happens. That's where the crisis of faith becomes something we are faced with and we have a choice. Am I going to deal with that or not? Am I going to respond to that or not? Lord God, I pray for each person here today. And as they prayerfully, quietly in the seat, right where they are, just quietly pray, I, I ask you, God, to give them the thoughts that you want them to have and to think what they need to think so that they can deal with what it is you've put in front of them to deal with today. God, our prayers in these next few moments as we pray silently.